Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be down here. I'm actually admiring Marseille and thinking it looks a bit like where I originally come from, which is Sydney. I'm currently living in London, and if you, anybody who's been to London, you know it's both ugly and it has no landscape. Uh, this is rather more attractive and definitely has landscape. So one I want to talk about is a combination of both the debunking and reconsidering finance. But I want to start with what might seem like a strange question, and that is what would economics look like if it had succeeded? Because I don't think economics itself realised that it's failed. If you look back and see what was in many ways the inspiration for the way that economics is practiced today, it was trying to make, to mathematise and to operationalise Smith's concept of the invisible hand. Now, I do recommend to students in the room do not trust a textbook rendition of what Smith said. They're always wrong. In fact, what he was talking about was not specialisation, um, not efficiency within one country, but the invisible hand is a reason why capitalists would not move from one country to another despite the profitable advantages of doing so. Nothing to do with um, trade in general. But nonetheless, this is his statement. He said, by directing industry in such a manner as, it, as its produce may be of the greatest value, he, the capitalist, intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Okay? Think about that. That is basically saying the market is omniscient and the socially optimal outcomes of, occur despite what individuals might be trying to achieve. Okay. Now what do we get? This is quoting from a book that I'm sure most of you have not read. I also both recommend and don't recommend reading it. Two reasons. It's one of the greatest lots of garbage ever published. It won its writer a Nobel Prize. And if you don't read it, you might believe it's worth reading. So I do think you should read it for the sheer pain of seeing how bad it is. I'm talking about a Frenchman here, Gerard de Brewer. You will find many economists saying that their models are arrow de Brewer consistent. And that's, that's a good thing. It's nonsense. This is de Brewer talking about what, how he models production in this book called The Theory of Value. And here he says, for a producer, a production plan, now notice that thing made now for the whole future. In other words, let's say on the 13th of January 1999, uh, one makes a production plan which is going to include the next 25,000 years, just roughly speaking. I wish I was joking. Made now for the whole future is a specification of the quantities of all his inputs and all his outputs. Wait for this. This is just to show us how absurd this is. The certainty assumption implies that he knows what input-output combinations would be possible in the future, although he may not know the details of the technical processes which will make them possible. So somebody in the year 1999 knows they've got to buy Xeon gas or something in the year 2532, because in that year it'll be possible to use ion production rockets to get between Jupiter and Mars. It's a fantasy. And rather than Smith's idea, now, what actually is going on here is economists think they're a trend, they've gone from Smith's idea to operationalizing Smith's idea. But in fact, they've turned Smith upside down. Smith's idea would work with dumb people because the market aggregates our overall intelligence. Here instead, we're talking about omniscient individuals working out optimal outcomes as if they are gods. If I believed in God, I'd be willing to believe that God knows what production processes are going to occur on Earth in the year 2525. Okay? But I don't believe I'm God. I don't believe anybody in this room is God. But economic theory assumes you're all God to be able to solve its mathematical problems. So we've gone from a, a vision of a market directing individuals, despite what their intentions might be, to a model of individuals who are so omniscient they can predict the future, in which case it begs the question, 
Why do they need a market? It's the complete inversion of what Smith was trying to achieve. And economists have got there through a series of steps that they think are logically consistent at each point along the way. In fact, that is not the case of what's happened. What they had tried to prove is that the economy would, would converge to a socially optimal equilibrium over time. And because they couldn't get there using the strict mathematics that they had to do to analyse whether multiple markets could reach equilibrium uh, and so on, they fudged. And each of those fudges ended up pointing them in the opposite direction with the opposite intention of what Smith was trying to achieve. So, for example, and I imagine most people in this room aren't old enough, some of us are, to know what general equilibrium looked like in the 1960s and 70s. Back then it was called computable general equilibrium. And what it was looking at was working out whether there was a vector of prices that could ensure that the input-output matrix using some commodities to produce other commodities could be stable and reach an ideal equilibrium at a, uh, at a point in time which would then move through time. Now that was pulled apart by accident, by sheer accident, by, mathemat by pure mathematicians in the 1910s and 1920s by the names of Perron and Frobenius who proved the properties of a matrix which happens to be the same type of matrix that describes production. And they showed it was unstable. They weren't trying to destroy economics doing it. They, economics was collateral damage. But what economists did was ignore that and continue on anyway. And then all sorts of distortions occurred to try to fudge around the way that failed to happen. These days, the new intertemporal general equilibrium presumes you can represent the tastes of an entire society with what they call a representative agent. Now, why do they have that? Because they show if you have more than one agent, the demand could be derived not just not for the economy at the aggregate level, but even for an individual market. That demand curve, even if you're adding up the demands of individuals who each have the downward sloping individual demand curve you do derive from indifference curves and budget constraints and so on, even if each individual has that characteristic, the demand curve they can derive in their model can have any shape you can draw using a polynomial, squiggly all over the place. So they get around, they, they jump around that as well with rationalisation. So in that sense, economics has failed. But it doesn't realise it's failed. If it had succeeded, it would be explaining that despite stupid people, even people as stupid as Donald Trump, the market can reach equilibrium and everybody's better off, except for those who get annihilated in a nuclear cloud because he doesn't like North Korea. Okay. So I think economists are what you can call in denial. This is an English joke. And denial stands for don't even know I am lying. <coughs> Since you're watching this video, you know that I'm a leading critic of conventional economics and also a developer of a realistic alternative. And now I need your help. After you've watched this video, pop over to Patreon and support my work for as little as $1 a month. And if these lies turn up in what you're taught in conventional courses. I'm fairly aware that Kedge is rather unconventional. I'm very pleased by that. Uh, for example, leverage does not matter in finance or macroeconomics. And if you look at Medigliani Miller, the hypothesis for whether, whether dividends matter in terms of valuing firms and also what's the best leverage position for a firm, they tell you that leverage companies can't command a premium over unleveraged ones because investors can buy firms that are unleveraged by borrowing money and firms that are leveraged can be bought by, uh, by investors who have just used pure cash. Therefore, one cancels out the other, and leverage will not have any impact on the value of an individual firm or on the value of the entire stock market. And then you told in terms of the what, what is the ratio, relationship between risky assets and so-called non-risky assets? Well, it's going to be a nice straight line relationship between the two. That's the uh, capital asset pricing model. And also, you can ignore leverage in macroeconomics because um, is. Everybody knows Ben Bernanke, I presume, and you all know Irving Fisher as well, I hope. And Irving Fisher, after he made the world's worst prediction until the 2000s when the OECD made the world's worst prediction, uh, he made the prediction saying the stock market had reached a permanently high plateau. And then he revised his vision and saw that leverage and disequilibrium were essential to explaining the Great Depression. Ben Bernanke rejected it because According to 
conventional theory, lending is just a pure redistribution, and that shouldn't matter unless there are enormous differences between the two groups. So that's, that's where the mythology is led us with economic theory. So according to that, there should be no relationship, either for individual shares or the entire market, between, between the level of individual leverage, in the stock markets that means between the level of margin loans, and the price, price of shares. So this, therefore, should be a zero correlation. The blue line is the what's called the Robert Schiller's uh, uh, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, or CAPE. That's graphed on the right-hand axis, and that's just an index of the ratio of the price of a share to the price of all shares to the earnings of all shares adjusted to cyclical deviations. And the red line is the ratio of margin debt on the New York Stock Exchange to America's GDP. Now, according to the type of statements I've been reading out the previous slide from Sharp and so on and so forth, that should have no significant correlation. Well, it's 0.7 over half a century. I think that's fairly empirically strong disconfirmation of that proposition. The causal relationship, as I explained in uh, debunking economics and also my new book, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis, is between the change in new mortgages, which is the acceleration of total, sorry, change in, in new margin debt, which is the acceleration of total margin debt, and the change in the price to earnings ratio. Now this is correlating a second difference with the first difference, which I frankly did not thought the economic data would be strong enough to support. The correlation there is 0.5 over, over half a century. Again, empirically blasting neoclassical thought out the window, and this data has existed for, cent for decades, but economists don't look at it because they're, in the old Latin phrase, a priori beliefs, I mean they don't think there is a relationship, so let's not look for one. It's there. We should be starting from the data. This is another relationship that should be zero. This is looking at the acceleration in mortgage debt, the change in new mortgages, and the relationship with house prices in America. That's also supposed to be zero. That's 0 0.7. This is private debt and the annual change in GDP. That's supposed to be zero. That's 0 0.7. I'm putting together lots of research proposals for students in the room, by the way, if you want to do an interesting master's or PhD contradicting uh, still established beliefs in economics. This is change in private debt in the Japan and unemployment. That's supposed to be zero, according to Ben Bernanke. It's minus 0.89 as a correlation coefficient. United States, between 1990 and pretty much today, the correlation between change in private debt and the unemployment rate, which again, according to Ben Bernanke, there should be no significant macroeconomic impact from pure, pure redistributions, as he calls them, that's got a correlation coefficient of minus 0.93. So there's a whole range of fallacies. Clearly there have to be fallacies and theories that tell you these things are zero when they're actually closer to one. And the fallacies in finance come from the, the derivation of the capital asset pricing model, the assumptions that were made to make that model work. Now, you might not know it from you read the textbooks, but the model from which it was derived was the model of a single investor with their ex investor's own expectations of what shares would be worth, both in terms of returns and standard deviations of returns, and their own access to finance, how much they could borrow, and what rate they would pay, and then to be able to make it a model of a more than one investor simply assumes all investors have exactly the same expectations, homogeneity of investor expectations. And second, what that means is, as Sharp elaborates, we're all expected to agree on what every share is going to earn, what their standard deviations are, what their correlation coefficients will be. So you couldn't have a dinner party conversation about IBM versus Google because you'd all agree with each other. You'd just be nodding. Dinner party conversations about <coughs> investments would be just a whole lot of people nodding. Okay. I'd be nodding off, frankly. Now, what Sharp then did later, most people don't know he wrote this paper, is to say, well, in fact, that assumption is wildly at variance with reality. 
And often neoclassicals will defend their assumption on the basis that it's a simplifying assumption. Now, a simplifying assumption should not make a radical difference to your conclusions if you remove it. Okay. If I assume the force of gravity is roughly 9.8 metres per second squared in a vacuum, and I admit that I'm actually standing in the middle of a column of air, then if I jump off a window, that shouldn't mean that the force of gravity goes from 9.8 metres per second squared to 0 0.1 metres per second squared. If I tested that theory and jumped off the fourth floor of this building, I think I'd kill myself. Okay. I don't think I'd float slowly to the bottom. So that's a simplifying assumption. But here he's saying, well, people hold passionately different beliefs. The seller of an IBM share is convinced it's worth less than the sales price. The buyer is convinced it's worth a lot more. So what happens if you take that into account? Well, here's Sharp himself. The consequences of accommodating such aspects of reality are likely to be disastrous in terms of the theory. The capital market line no longer exists. There's no single optimal combination of risky preferences. The theory is in a shambles. This is not a critic, this is the person who drafted the theory. Admitting what happens to that simplifying assumption that we all agree about everything. And also, by the way, we're not only agree, we're right. This is admitted by Pamela uh, and French some time later. So this theory, which still dominates finance, Pamela and French, who were the major protagonists for the theory for 20 or 30, 40 years actually, say the attraction is it makes a powerful and intuitively pleasing set of predictions. Unfortunately, the empirical record is poor, poor enough to invalidate the way it's used in applications. Now, it's still taught, and partly why it's still taught is that just like nature, humanity abhors a vacuum. If we don't have a theory, we'd rather a good theory, we'd rather stick with a bad one than move on to a new theory. And that's where we're stuck right now. But that's not that's not necessary. Because you can, just by applying what mathematicians have been doing for decades now, pretty much a century, is work out a reasonable set of causal factors in terms of, for example, what determines house prices. This is new work on doing with uh, Paul Omerond and, uh, and, and Nyman. Unfortunately, I've been dragging the chain and writing my part of the paper. I did the mathematics. I'm supposed to also do the uh, economic history, the history of economic thought behind arguments about the house prices. But I'll take you through the basic idea. If you want to say what determines house prices, rather than this mythical ideas of the capital asset pricing model, let's just say there's a, the fundamental demand for housing is the flow of new mortgages. And if you divide that flow of new mortgages, which is the rate of change of mortgage debt, you divide that by the price level for housing, you get a rough idea of the flow of, money, of physical demand, how many new houses per year are being demanded. And the flow of physical supply on the other side, and by the way, I'm talking about flow very deliberately because I'm including time. This is not equilibrium thinking. Everything else you've done in economics tends to be supply and demand intersecting curves, no question of a, a flow through time, but flow through time is what we actually mean by demand and supply. So with supply, if there's a time varying turnover of existing stock of houses, people trying to flip to make a profit, people getting divorced and splitting up their property, um, that sort of thing happening, people moving cities, uh, and there's also new supply coming on board, so that's my supply, supply of supply. And I can now show prices are equilibrating mechanism, so I'm not objecting to the idea of saying price is a mechanism that attempts to equilibrate the two together. It's only wrong when you say that it has to reach equilibrium, which it doesn't in most dynamic systems, and it's only wrong when you assume that equilibrium is stable, which in most complex systems it's not. Okay. So that's what I'm not doing that neoclassicals do. So I then say, well, price is influenced by the flow of demand and by the supply, and then I'm not going to give given time constraints, I won't go through the full derivation here, but the basic idea is to say, well, the rate of change of prices is then a function of this interaction between the flow of demand and flow of supply. And with a bit of simple calculus, I get to the stage of finally having a price equation. I'm, I'm glad I'm not asking the translators to attempt to do this as I hit the end key. But I've got the rate of change of prices is some function of this acceleration of mortgage debt, which turns up in the argument, uh, minus the acceleration uh, partially also of supply. 
So a big question in the setting this equation forward is people argue maybe people get into mortgage debt because house prices are rising. And my argument's always been no, rising mortgage debt causes rising house prices. So we put this through a Granger causality test and Granger causality is a very limited tech, tech it's, it's good to have it, but it's very limited because what it's basically telling you is exogenous force causes a movement. It's not designed for feedback effects in a complex system. It's not designed for nonlinear processes. So I was sceptical that we'd find a correlation here because a Granger causality test is likely to give you a type 1 error where there's actually a causal link but you have a null hypothesis of no relationship and it will say well, the null hypothesis is correct when it's not. It's very likely to make that sort of mistake with a complex nonlinear system. Much to my amazement, the test came out strongly in favour of the hypothesis. So this is the uh, Nyman doing the, the uh, econometrics here. But the argument that the causation went from uh, how debt, which acceleration of debt to change in house prices, uh, had a p-value of 0.003 whereas the opposite characterization had a p-value of 0.15. So clearly saying, OK, mortgage debt acceleration causes house price change. So we've gone from a theory derived from, in a dynamic sense, explaining something that mainstream economics can't explain. <coughs> Similar thing happens in finance. This is one of my favourite economists, not Paul Krugman. <laughs> he doesn't like me either, so it's even-handed. Uh, and he's saying, think about when people borrow money, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. It's rather less patient people borrowing from more patient people. Well, the Bank of England, and even the Bundesbank has come out recently and said that's garbage. Virtually a personal letter to Paul Krugman saying the reality of how money is created differs from the description found in some economics textbooks. Some is actually a code word for almost all of them, of course. Rather than banks receiving deposits and lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. And in normal times, the central bank does not fix the amount of money in circulation, nor is central bank money multiplied up into more loans and deposits. So what's taught in textbooks is now being directly contradicted by central banks. And I'm delighted the central banks are doing that because the textbook writers won't wake up unless they're kicked in the proverbials, and that's what the banks are doing now. So if you make this assumption that banks are just intermediaries, then you can ignore banks in macroeconomics, and if that comes up in discussion, I'll show how that's the case. Credit has no impact upon aggregate demand that way. It's such a trivial impact, you can ignore it. But if you do that, and that's your belief, then you miss the biggest events in economic history, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Now, if you make the realistic assumption that bank lending creates money, and I call that bond, by the way, for bank originated money and debt, then you get the result, first of all, banks are essential. You can't analyse the macroeconomy without including banking in there. This is a little model in Minsky that I can show later if I have enough time. And the empirical result is you can see that crises are coming. Now, you can't... Uh, and the reason you can do that is when you admit that banks create money, when they create that money, the person who's borrowing is spending it. And because that spending is not being offset by somebody else's decline in spending, Credit is part of aggregate demand and also aggregate income. Now, you can't predict when a crisis is going to occur precisely because it's a complex system. You've got to see when borrowing behaviour is going to turn in the opposite direction. There are at least two parties to that, banks on the one side, non-banks on the other. And the government, as I've seen in Australia's case, can dive in to try to sustain a bubble by policy that encourages people to continue borrowing long enough that they should have stopped. But you can predict that something is imminent and that it's also inevitable. And this is showing you data now going back to 1834 in America. Um, and this is, you can see that there are three major crises, I mean really major crises, like the 2008, like the Great Depression, and one before which is known as the Panic of 18, 1835 to 1837. In each case, during those panics, credit, which is the change in, and change in debt creates new money, so when these happen, change in it is actually negative, so you're destroying money. And the red line is the ratio of private debt to GDP in America. The blue line is the annual change in that debt. And you can't see it on the screen there, but you can see if I can point it here. Let's see if my mouse is working. There we go. Uh, 
Okay, that's the zero point. So anything below this point, credit is negative and subtracting from demand. Well, there's the panic of 1837. Credit was about minus 10% of GDP. There's the Great Depression, again about minus 10. And there's what we went through in 2008, hit about minus 5, minus 6% of GDP. So in each case, the combination of the level of debt and its rate of change can warn you that a crisis is about to occur. Um, now again, does this mean we've got to abandon theory? No, it just means we have to get rid of a silly theory, which is the theory that banks don't matter. And I have, the model that I first developed that helped me warn of the crisis back in 2008, I developed in 1992. And I did it in a different fashion, but I've since realised that I can actually derive the model by taking three macroeconomic definitions. The employment rate, the wages share of GDP, and the private debt ratio. And if I simply differentiate those with respect to time, I get three definitions now stated rather than in ratio terms, I get them stated in terms of rates of change. And the first one becomes the employment will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of population and labour productivity growth. <coughs> that wage to share of GDP will rise if wage rises exceed growth and labour productivity, and finally the debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. And I'm talking about private debt there. Now those are three definitionally true statements. If you put them into a, a simple model, the model comes from assuming simple relationships between each of those nth variables, and they are a linear Phillips curve, a linear relationship between level of employment and wage change, a linear investment function, so a linear relationship between profit and the level of investment is GDP, and all borrowed money being used to finance genuine investment, no Ponzi schemes, put that together, I get two possible outcomes. Stability, if the debt to GDP ratio stabilises, so that's a graph of this happening, and you have cycles in the level of private debt converging to a level of about, in this particular Simple simulation, about 75% of GDP. And the employment rate cycling and heading towards equilibrium over time as well. But if you have it being unstable, so debt continues rising and hits the sort of levels we're seeing in the real world now, then what you get, and look very carefully at the bottom graph here, is an apparent moderation before the crisis hits. So the cycles diminish more rapidly than if you're approaching equilibrium, but then they get bigger on the other side. So my model back in 1992 predicted what we now call, not just what we call the, the Great Recession, but also the Great Moderation that preceded it. And with this realistic approach, which you can drive, you can drive macroeconomics from macroeconomics, we find that private debt is the main destabilising factor in capitalism. And what's happened, because neoclassical economists told us it didn't matter, either in finance or in macroeconomics, under their noses, we've accumulated the bigger level of private debt, debt in human history. And that is what's actually causing what other people are calling secular stagnation. It's actually credit stagnation. And this has all happened because of bad economic theory. I don't blame the economists for it. They didn't make people go out and borrow. They did encourage people to go out and borrow, of course. But their theory blinded us to it. And now we're stuck in the consequences. So to give you a bit of an empirical handle of of um, why both the level of debt and the level of the change of debt matter. You can have a crisis in a capitalist economy simply if the rate of growth of debt slows down if the level of debt's very high. Because the basic logic I've derived in a number of recent papers is that aggregate demand in the economy is not just the turnover of existing money. That's Milton Friedman's V times N. Okay. It's the turnover of existing money plus credit which is the change in money, which, when banks are creating that money, is the change in debt. So that's your total demand. So imagine you have an economy with a very low uh, level of debt to GDP, and the GDP is, say, a thousand, thousand trillion, a thousand billion euros or a thousand billion dollars a year, and it's growing at 10% per annum. And private debt is 50% of GDP, so it's 500 billion, and that's growing twice as fast as GDP, 20% per annum. Well, your total demand that year is going to be 1.1 trillion. A, bill, a trillion from the turnover of existing money, and then 20% of 500 billion, which is another $100 billion of demand coming from credit. 
And now imagine next year, the GDP is still growing nice and smoothly, it's $1.1 trillion, but the growth of debt slows down to only 10% per annum. Well, 10% of 600 billion is 60 billion. You add that in, your total demand is $1.16 trillion, which is 60 billion more than the year before. So demand is still growing. That's demand for assets as well as for consumer goods. If, on the other hand, you have the level of, levels of debt we now see of twice GDP, and we start from the same situation for GDP, a trillion dollars a year and growing at 10%, but private debt being 200% of GDP will be two trillion dollars, and if that grows by 20%, that's $400 billion additional demand coming from credit. So your total demand in that first year is 1.4 trillion, a lot higher than the other situation. Now next year, if GDP still grows at 10%, but the growth of debt slows down to 10% per annum, the new change in debt that year is going to be 10% of 2.4 trillion, which is $240 billion. You add that to the GDP, it's 1.34 trillion. That's 60 billion less than the year before. So a crisis can come just at the rate of growth debt slows down. So they both matter. And what we see empirically is that that's, that's the trap that France is actually in right now. Macron thinks it's something else which is a real pity because he's wrong and his policies will make things worse here and I'm happy to talk about that later. But certainly in the Euro, one thing you've had is this belief that Eurozone, austerity is the right idea and uh, the current, I think she's still Prime Minister, I haven't checked today. Is she still Prime Minister? Yeah, okay, she, okay. Um, she thinks it's a good idea too. And again what we do is we put a household analogy, an individual analogy for an aggregate system and I want to show why that's wrong. So if you imagine yourself earning 200 euro a, a week or whatever, let's say this year 200 euro a week is an example, and you want to, you're not saving any money, so you decide it's, you're going to spend 10 less next, next week. I've got years here, but just to, to personalise it, works on any time scale. So you're going to spend 10 less, therefore you're going to save 10. And that's what looks like a good idea to all of us. We start with zero savings, we spend 10 less, we therefore put away 10 for a rainy day, and it seems like, I'm doing it, why don't you do it too? Well, when you put this in a macroeconomic framework, you've got to look at, at the point, point of view of other people in the same society, because your spending becomes somebody else's income. So we start from this situation in the first year, sector A is earning 200 uh, on the other two sectors, earning 200 from them in income, and therefore having no savings, then decides to spend 190, spends 10 less, therefore gains 10. But what's actually happened is that sectors A, B and C are getting five, in this case five pounds as I'm showing the example here. I gave this example last week to the Greens party in the UK. They're, spending, you're getting, they're getting five pounds less income from you, so because you're saving 10, their income has fallen by 10 between the two of them. So savings for the individual become a fallen income for the aggregate. They're over this saving. Not because they're being irresponsible, but because of the impact of your decision to spend less on their income. And that doesn't matter what sector you're calling it. It could be personal friends. It can be capitalists versus workers. It can be industrial sector versus agricultural sector. It can be France versus Germany. Okay? And if you have a, a, national, a set of national economies tied together like you are by the euro. So living within our means means spending less than you earn which is feasible for an individual or a component of a system. But at the macro level, they can't be different. Expenditure is income. Expenditure causes income. So if you do, everybody decides to save, rather than all saving, what you cause is income declines. And if all three sectors have decided to do the same thing, they all decide to spend 10 less, then total GDP in this example falls by 30. So austerity is the wrong way around. Now, I'm actually getting worried about running out of time here. How am I, how am I doing for time? Do I keep going? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. I'll try to get through in five. So, of course, we're all, we all would like to accumulate. This is a quote from Marx. Accumulate, accumulate. That is Moses and the prophets. And on that front, I don't think anybody would disagree with him. That is an intention most people have in society. But we can't all accumulate. On that accounting operation I've showed you, your savings become somebody else's drop in income. So we can't all accumulate unless there's some mystery sector 
that spends more than it earns and can do that indefinitely. So I'm putting in a question mark sector here. Um, and I'm increasing expenditure by 20 of each of the other two sectors. Sector A, B and C are now spending 20 on sector question mark. But sector question mark is spending 30 on each of them. And because of that, their, their expenditure is 220, their income is 230, they're each saving 10. So they should all be happy. <coughs> the question is, what can sector question mark be? How can some sector spend more than it gets back in every year? Well, it could be the banking sector, because what, in effect the analogy for spending for the banking sector is lending money, creating new money. The analogy for getting money back is having debts repaid. So if le banks are lending out each year more than they're getting back in repayments, yes, they can add that additional money to the other two sectors. There's only one problem. If a bank lends you money, it records an identical debt you've got to the bank somewhere else. So you get more cash in your account, balanced by an identical additional debt. So in net terms, you're no better off. You might start a housing bubble and profit by flipping the house to somebody else, but your net financial assets have not changed. What about if the government spends more than it gets back in taxation? Now, if the government spends on you, it doesn't give you an equivalent bill. If you're a contractor and you get paid by the government, it doesn't say, okay, here's a million dollars, by the way, you owe us a million dollars. Okay. You say, here's a million dollars, thanks for the goods you've given us. Okay. They're a welfare recipient. They make life miserable for you, but they don't say, here's your doll check, you owe us the doll check back. Okay. Here's the doll check, spend it. So the government can do it. That would increase your uh, deposit accounts by 30, but of course, the old uh, comeback that's always made it is, where is the money going to come from? There's no magic money trick. And that's correct. There's actually two. In fact, three if you have a trade surplus. The central bank owns, the government owns a bank called the central bank. Now, neoclassical economists have forced rules on legal rules to stop central banks showing you what I'm showing in these summarised tables. But if central banks, so they, the, the Treasury cannot sell directly to the central bank. What actually does happen, the Treasury sells to the finance sector, and then the finance sector gets involved in open market operations with the Treasury, with the central bank. And those open market operations buy bonds back off the um, financial sector, sometimes sell them back as well, of course. But in that buying operation, they're actually doing in three steps what I'm showing in two here. So what can ultimately happen is the Treasury sells bonds to the central bank, Remember, I had to finance 30 there, and imagine the interest rate is 10%. So I've got the Treasury selling bonds worth 33 to the central bank. Therefore, the assets of the central bank rise by 33. The liabilities also rise by 33. Then the Treasury spends that money on the public, and then with the three additional, it pays interest to the central bank out of money the central bank has created. So the payment of interest by the Treasury actually increases the equity of the central bank. And then that 30 is spent by putting money to people's deposit accounts, which increases the reserve assets of the private banks as well. So rather than it being impossible for the government to pay the interest, payment of the interest increases the equity of the central bank. And there are other issues about central banks I'm happy to discuss in question time as well. Now, if the government does the opposite and does what auto-liberal rules force you to do in the Eurozone, of all attempting to run a surplus, if you read the Maastricht Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty, that's what the objective is. All governments should attempt to at least have a balanced budget and preferably run a surplus. If that actually happens, what that means is, yes, the government's uh, taxing you 20 here, but it's only spending 10 back. So the government accumulates a, sur a surplus of 30 in this particular year, but it forces all those sectors into negatives. So what looks like responsible finance is actually taking money out of your accounts, which is the turnover of which generates GDP, and then it's telling you, grow faster with less money. Great advice. So you drive the rest of the economy into a deficit, and that's one reason we end up with private debt doubles frequently, because often this sort of huge running of the government surplus has preceded major crises. If you look at the Great Depression, which of course is worse than America, the 1920s was the only decade in which the government has maintained a surplus every year. They ran a surplus of 1% of GDP. That was supposedly saving for a rainy day. It actually helped cause the Great Depression because 
with the government taking money out of the economy, people could borrow money from the banks, the banks were happy to lend for margin loans, we got the stock market bubble and then the crash on the Great Depression. So rather than this being saving for a rainy day, it's causing a hurricane. So what we should be doing is having QE for the people, and again, I think I'm running out of my five minutes here, so I might just wind up at that point uh, and say, we need a new economics. I know you're causing part of it here at Kedge. I'm trying to do the same myself, both through my writing and through uh, getting supported on Patreon. I'm happy to talk about that too. But thank you, and here's the Kedge.